So here we are with Rosa Leff and Howard Feynman, who you may be able to see on the sides of your screen, but if not, you'll be hearing them speaking relatively soon. Um, before we talk with them, we're just going to, uh, sorry, so many people coming in, which is awesome. I have like about over 20 people. Um, sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. Oops. We're going to be just learning a little bit about where Beacon Gallery is and then what show this is. And then you'll hear a little bit about who the artists are. I'll take you on a brief virtual tour. And then we'll have a conversation with Howard and Rosa and there'll be some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, so I'm Christine O'Donnell. I am the owner, director, curator, Jack of all trades of Beacon Gallery here in Boston, which I opened in 2017. Um, so this is truly a fully woman owned business, kind of a one woman owned business <laughs> right now. And um, our mission is to offer shows that are related to social justice and community building and pretty much whatever tickles my fancy as well. Um, this, we, so we curate shows around social justice issues, we show affordable and accessible art so that everyone really feels welcome. That's part of what I consider social justice also. We present art events. We also work with artists from different regions and from different places in their careers. So welcome to our community. And this show that we currently have on is called Urban Landscapes. It's open through the 14th of February. So please, if you want, come and see it in person. It's a four artist show. We have Sam Belisle, Howard Feynman, Rosa Leff, and Michael McLaughlin. Um, Michael McLaughlin is here as well this evening, although he won't be speaking. He'll be doing his own artist talk with Sam Belisle in a couple of weeks on the 10th of February. Um, and this show focuses on how four different artists have translated the urban landscape into their own unique visions and offer some new perspectives on the modern American landscape of the 21st century. So Rosa Leff, who we have here, is a graduate of Sarah Lawrence College, undergrad, and University of Pennsylvania for graduate school. She also studied with Alejandro Cordobes at Instituto Superior del Arte in Havana, Cuba. Um, she serves on the board of the Guild of American Paper Cutters and has exhibited her work throughout the East Coast of the US and in China. She's had 10 solo shows, has been reviewed in the Washington Post and has received multiple grants for her work. She resides in Baltimore, Maryland with her husband and her chihuahuas, Chalupa and Refrito. So welcome, Rosa. Howard Feynman is a graduate of MIT, Northeastern and Stanford and has worked in tech and aerospace and defense before becoming a professional artist. He's an architectural photographer, has been showing his artwork around the Boston area for approximately 10 years, and has been in juried shows and has won awards for his artwork. He is a SCORE Association certified mentor for small business entrepreneurs and is a member of the National Advisory Council and served as Boston chapter co-chair in 2015 to 2016. He lives in Newton, Massachusetts with his wife. So I'm going to take all of you on a little virtual tour. This is going to take me probably a second to enter into Zoom. So here we go. This is the entrance to Urban Landscapes, the four artists. So I'm just going to do a quick tour. I don't want to take up too much of our time, but we have work by Michael McLaughlin and Howard Feynman right when we come in. And we'll have a chance to talk about the works by the artists. And I also have on the presentation images of each of the pieces. So don't worry that you're not getting to see them really up close because you will have a chance to see them closer in a little while. So you can see here we have two different pieces. We have Order and Chaos, Hanoi by Howard Feynman and Rosa Left Snow Day. I put next to each other because I loved the way the power lines looked near each other. And as you can see here, we have, those are actually snow tracks that have been cut out. And then we will work by Sample Isle. Four of 
four pieces by Rosa. I always think it's interesting to see as well how works have been placed in a space. This is Michael McLaughlin's largest piece in the show, Posted Keep Out, and one of his newest. Moving towards the back, this is a piece taken from above at the Whitney Museum. Another Whitney Museum stairwell facing it. For those of you who may not have been in Beacon Gallery before, we are a downstairs space in Boston Soa neighborhood in the South End. So you can see our stairs, see where I've been sitting. I'm just gonna do a quick tour of this wall and then I'll turn this off. So here we have light at the end of the work week, which is a piece by Rosa Leff. We'll be focusing on these two a little bit, um, which is actually a paper cut of Howard Feynman's light at the end of the tunnel. Here's a piece by Michael McLaughlin. Love both of these pieces by Rosa. On the smaller side, they can fit almost anywhere if you're looking to get a piece by Rosa Leff from the show. Here's another one by Michael McLaughlin. All his work is based around the Boston area. So that's a piece from Charlestown. Next to Bazaar by Rosa Leff. And Daily Bread. Lots of vibrant colors there. And you can see the color combination, how we transition from Rosa's work into these three pieces by Howard. First one was Musings on Calatrava Design 2 in Milwaukee. Order in Chaos, New York. And then another from Milwaukee. I then have another of Sambal Isles pieces. He was inspired by the protests this summer, the Black Lives Matter protests who create work. If you're interested in learning more about that, make sure to attend his artist talk. We have this piece. And Howard, this is the work that you hadn't seen yet. Pensive in the Tuileries in Paris. So that's everything. Say farewell. I need to unmute myself. Apologies to those of you who were entered the waiting room while I was giving that tour. I, that I could not do both of those things at the same time. Um, so there we are. We did a quick virtual tour. Howard and Rose, I might ask that you unmute yourselves now. And I am going to spotlight, hopefully both of you. Thanks for doing spotlight. I mean, you know, this was my first chance to see everything hung and kind of in place. Sorry, I just realized I was, I, I still had it like, so I couldn't hear anything that you were saying. I got the end of that, that you enjoyed seeing everything hung up. Oh yeah. <laughs> you, like I couldn't get a picture, a sense of the scale before because I, of course I didn't get to see everything hung. I'm always down for a road trip, but with these strange times, I haven't been able to make it back over. <laughs> well, I would have been happy to give you your own personal tour. You didn't have to wait for this event. And that goes for anyone else I can give encores and slower ones as well so it's but I'm so glad that you did get to see that um it makes me really happy um so what yeah, I want to do is I, yeah, I, just really, I can attest to that we did it uh last week yes <laughs> and, and seeing it in person really does make a difference yes you came in on your own so I also will do I'll do private in-person tours private virtual tours all you have to do is contact me and I'll, I'll figure something out that feels COVID friendly for anyone. Um, so what I think we're gonna do right now, Howard and Rosa, is I just have like a few different questions, but I thought that I would allow you guys to 
each answer them as opposed to focusing on one of you and then focusing on the other. And we'll just see where the conversation brings us. And uh, if our audience has any questions, they are more than welcome to put them into the chat or to chime in. And Rosa and Howard, if you guys have questions for each other, please feel free to turn this into a conversation as well. Um, so Rosa, why don't we just start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your origin story and how you get to, got started as a paper cutter? Yeah, I, so I have a very artsy family, I guess. Um, my dad did reproduction antique furniture just for fun. My grandmother made her living as a dancer first and then as an oil painter. Um, you know, my aunt has like covered her own home in murals of her own work. Uh, so lots of creativity around me and I just went to art galleries and things all the time, took lots of art classes. And then I found paper cutting when I was in graduate school, actually. Um, I have a master's in elementary education and one of our projects was to create a children's book. And I just like on a whim basically bought an X-Acto knife for the first time and figured out that I was a lot better at that than painting or anything else I had tried. And it's just like, if you're interested in the art, once you find your medium, it just like clicks. And it was like, oh my goodness, I can actually do this. I can make it look the way I want it to look. And I have been hooked ever since. <laughs> wow, and your art really is amazing. I mean, it has clicked, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Indeed. you. Indeed. Uh, Howard, what about you? How did you get started as an architectural photographer? Uh, the architectural part came a, m much more recently. Uh, I started taking uh, black and white uh, film uh, pictures when I was a teenager, did my own uh, wet darkroom processing. And uh, then after college, I moved to, to uh, color slide film. And that's all I shot pretty much for decades. Um, until digital came along. Um, I had always done it as a hobby until um, I, I joked that I made the mistake of listening to some of my friends who said, gee, when you retire, you should sell your work. And so I tried and I succeeded and I've been doing it ever since. I love it. Um, who would you say your biggest influences are. Uh, Howard, why don't we kind of keep going with you? Who influences you? Are they photographers? Are they people you know? Are they, what, where do you um, get your influence? Lots, it? lots of art in just about every vein you can think of, but especially photographers. Um, I've been influenced by, you know, when I was a teenager and early adult by the, the old masters. Um, but yeah, more recently, when I first started getting into the professional side, I was really focusing more on landscape. And I did workshops with uh, Steve Johnson, who amazing uh, early digital photographer um, in the national parks, and then with Allison Shaw in um, Martha's Vineyard. And um, the architectural was more about you know, shapes and all the different aspects that just attracted my eye. And as I got more and more into that, uh, I just kept doing more and more of it and doing it uh, differently as I went. And I'm still experimenting. I love it. Rosa, what about you? Who are your influences? I actually get a lot of my inspiration from outside of the paper cutting world, uh, which I guess is a little funny, but I really love uh, Roberto Lugo right now and Paul Scott, who are both uh, ceramic artists. So Paul Scott works in a lot of like traditional blue and white China sorts of patterns, but really bringing them into the modern day. So he's got, you know, a traditional like swallows flying around in the blue and white, but then there will be a graffiti covered bridge. Um, and Roberto Lugo has sort of reclaimed traditional pottery methods. So he'll have a very ornate uh, China teapot that he has painted Harriet Tubman on instead, for example, um, just kind of idolizing his putting pictures of his heroes in these places where you wouldn't traditionally expect them. And I kind of like that. I think it feels sort of in line with some of my work of, you know, paper cutting is a very traditional folk art, but you don't see a lot of paper cuts that look the way that mine do. And I definitely try to re uh, represent my own, you know, urban city kid upbringing. Sure, kind of taking a traditional art and making it subversive in a sort of way. Yeah. Um, You'll have to tell me the names of those artists again because that sounds like something I would really like as well. I've always I've always loved um, 
those styles. So I'd, I'd be interested to learn more about those artists. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about the collaboration process. So we, we had our, or you guys did a works where um, each of you, we had a piece by Howard that's actually the one behind him right now. And Rosa, you actually took that piece and did a paper cutting of it. Um, maybe the best place to, I would love to hear about that process. Perhaps the best place to start with that is um, Howard, maybe how you shot the picture. And then Rosa, you can talk a little bit about where you went with the work from there. And what I'm gonna do as well is um, show everyone the two images next to each other at the same time while you guys are talking. Okay. So this picture is um, called Light at the End of the Tunnel it is a tunnel under the National Art, or actually between the two National Art Galleries in Washington, uh, the IMP East Building and the John Russell Pope Old Classic West Building. Um, and we were there and I, I saw this and I was just mesmerized by it. Um, I would probably still be there. I took this picture quite a few years ago. If my wife hadn't said, you know, we do have other things to do today. Um, the light patterns change. Uh, there are 32,000 LEDs in the ceiling or in those slats and they change on a quasi random basis. And so it, it's a continually changing experience and uh, you can just stand there and soak it all in or shoot a lot of pictures. And I did both. I love it. And yes, this is, I have to say, this is one of the pictures of yours, Howard, that um, I originally juried into a show at the Boston Society of Architects, I believe, and one that really made an impression on me. And um, so when we were thinking about doing this collaboration, where Rosa was gonna do a paper cut of your work. Um, I did think that this would be an interesting one to do because it, it was a piece that it had already, had always uh, really caught my eye. And um, it is a little bit different, I think, Rosa, from, from the work that I've seen you do in the past. But um, why don't you tell us what it was like for you working on this piece? You know, it was interesting when we got started. I know Howard sent me a folder with some options, some different pieces I could work from. And I think we have a, a similar eye, although I do agree, Christine, that my works tend to look very different. But what I loved about this piece in part was that it reminded me of one that I did a really bad job with before of uh, Escalator in Tokyo. And I saw those lines and I was like, I'm going to do it better this time. And I just, there's something so like, I don't know, it's, the rays and there's a hopefulness to it but still being kind of underground and this work week hustly uh, busyness to it that I really appreciate and I didn't realize until you just said that that the lights change here but it makes a lot of sense now and sort of the randomness of it and I you know wasn't sure how much of that was just the reflection and how much of that was um, the intentionally you know the installed lights but it was definitely a, a little bit stressful because when you're working from another artist's work, you know, you want to honor their intentions with the piece. But of course, I still have to uh, make sure I'm, you know, keeping the structure of the paper and there are limitations to working in a paper cut medium. But I really got very meditative about cutting all of those teeny tiny little LED bulbs. <laughs> And uh, I enjoyed working on this piece a lot. And I think they, you know, mine definitely came out a lot darker and a lot heavier, um, but I think they convey a lot of the same feeling. Yes, and that sense of perspective. I think you both have that in your work where you, the eye is really drawn to this point in the piece. And I, and I love that. And that sense of, um, I think the, the shininess of the metal in a way also. What amazes me Rosa, with your work, is the fact that it remains one sheet of paper. That somehow, you know, I'll look at, um, for instance, in like the lower left-hand corner, you'll have that shimmering metal. And, and I'll say to myself, how is this possibly still connected to the rest of the paper? It looks like it must have detached itself in some way. Um, and not to focus on your failures, but have you ever had these experiences where you'll be almost done with something and then it'll tear or like what, what happens in those cases? What do you do? 
Uh, paper is stronger than a lot of people give it credit for. I don't think I've had anything that's torn, but I have definitely cut through things that I didn't mean to cut through or realize that I just put too much detail into something and it threw the balance off and you can't undo it. So uh, for me, that process mostly involves a lot of tequila. And, uh, either starting over the next day if it's a commission or something that I have to get done or just giving up on paper cutting for a week and then trying something completely different. <laughs> and how long does something like this take you? Oh goodness this piece honestly it's interesting because it's not just about the size of the piece if you look at this one close up those circles especially on the right hand side they're close to that seam with the wall they are mostly perfectly round and they are tiny, tiny, tiny. So I was kind of working on this one and then taking a break to go work on other things just to give my eyes a break. Um, so I worked on this one probably over the course of three or four weeks. Wow. Really fortunate that there weren't more of those 32,000 lights on. <laughs> I am very glad about that. Seriously. <laughs> I mean, there are places where you see they kind of blend together um, at the center, sort of right above the people. I think there's, you know, it takes on this sort of amorphous blob shape in my paper cut version of it, but where it's just a bunch of those lights grouped together. Hmm. Um, anything to add on the experience of working together from either of you? We didn't actually do too much interactively beyond the, the picking stage. Um, you know, I had sent Rosa a number of uh, different possibilities that uh, you already had in mind for the show. Um, and this is really the first time I've understood more of your thinking around how you pick that and why you pick that one. Uh, but uh, just before we uh, started this evening, I, you had your eyes on another on the stairwell. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I might need to keep going <laughs> if Howard will allow me to use more of his work. I like it. Where, um, so we have a question, which is what are the sizes of the originals? And I must admit, I don't have that information memorized. Do you guys know the sizes of these two pieces? Uh, yes, the, uh, the print is a 16 by 20, uh, the image itself is a 16 by 20 print. And, um, and I sized it for Rosa so that it would be exactly the same uh, because you wanted them to hang together. And um, so, the actual paper is 16 by, I'm sorry, the actual art is 16 by 20. The paper's a tad bigger. So of course my paper cut is 16 by 20. We were trying to keep them similar in scale. Yeah, I think we, we succeeded. They look great. We have one on top of the other here, even though they're presented side by side here for this landscape on a computer screen. Um, I decided that they did look best one on top of the other. And yeah, I'm really happy with how they turned out. And it was a really fun process to see, to do all of that. Um, Rosa, let's continue talking with you about your process and then Howard will come back to you on the same topic. Um, can, do you, is there anything you'd like to add just a little bit about like, how do you start? What do you do as a paper cutter? Like, do you wanna explain to the audience here a little bit more of like what paper cutting is as a, as oh, a I mean, that people know what painting is about, but. I don't know if people know how you get something like this out of, from a photograph, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I typically start with my original photographs here. Of course, I was working from Howard's and I just print it out to scale. I do very little photo editing, uh, partially because I'm not too great at it. And partially because a lot of what I do is really about reversing the positive and negative. Um, I think that's where my sort of distinct style comes in in a lot of ways, especially if you're looking at busier paper cuts of mine, like uh, bizarre or stretchy pants where there's, you know, a lot of layering of text in front of images on signs and people standing in front of them. Um, if I just cut away all of the white part of a picture, oh, that's a good example one. Um, so if I were to just cut away all of the white parts of the picture in this black and white image, then I might lose out on some of these characters up here at the top the letters and you know the images um, in their sign. So I'm really kind of picking and choosing as I go. And then the other reason that I don't do a lot of editing is that if I were to just put a threshold on there, I would lose a lot of the detail. Um, and so for example, here where the window is and you can see the, the cashier standing there, I left that really heavy and I think it needed that contrast, but that might've been lost out, lost with a filter. 
Um, but after I print them, I just tape them down here onto a black paper and use an X-Acto knife, just like a regular classic number 11 blade, except that mine fits into a holder that's a little bit like a ring pop almost and slides onto your finger. So it feels a little bit more like drawing to me. Um, and I cut through both layers. And then when I'm done, I just take off that printed photo and that part goes in the recycling or in the trash. And I cut my signature into them, uh, which is something else that is a bit unique about my paper cuts. I don't sign with pencil or pen or anything like that. I prefer to have the cut signature in there because I'm just really a purist about paper. <laughs> I love it. Now, Howard asked a really um, interesting question about the title of this piece. Do you want to just mention, talk a little bit about that? Because I thought it was too bad that everyone else didn't get to hear it. Like where this piece is from and how you ended up with the title. Yeah, so this piece is called Stretchy Pants and you might notice that you can't see anyone's pants in it. <laughs> um, but I took this picture in Yokohama uh, while I was on vacation and I just kind of turned the corner and all of a sudden I was in Chinatown and it's the only Chinatown I've ever been to that really is a Chinatown. It's not a melting pot of Asian cultures. Um, and you know, my, one of the two main things I do when I'm on vacation is eat. So of course I had already eaten by the time I got here and was really upset because it all smelled so good. And I just wanted to eat everything. And I love bao buns. And, you know, this was the first restaurant I think I saw when I walked over and uh, we did have some dim sum. We made it work, but my husband and I were just like trying to strategize, like how long of a walk do we need to go on? Do we need to go for a little run? Like, how do we make it so that we can eat all of this delicious food? Um, and before our, you know, chat with all of you guys started, we were talking about the idea that stretchy pants is really a pretty American concept, which I hadn't really thought of putting on your eating pants. Uh, but I actually took this piece with me for an exhibit in China, which was interesting. I had a translator who had the best of intentions, but really did not speak English. And, um, she was helping me translate the titles of my pieces to be able to put up some little plaques in the gallery to label the artwork. And she asked me what this piece was called. And I told her, and she like turns and says to the chairman of the Chinese, uh, the Xianyang Paper Cutters Association, that it's called stretchy pants. And he's like looking at me like he doesn't understand. And he's trying to figure out what we're talking about. And I literally just had to like pantomime, like pulling out stretchy pants and shoveling food into my mouth. And I'm like, I like to eat. It's called stretchy pants. <laughs> he's just like laughing. And it really uh, made this piece special for me. I love that. I love that. Now, Howard, you've done a lot of traveling, but less so to show your work and more to shoot. You've shot images all over the country, all over the world, in fact. Yep. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your process? I'm going to guess most of your process is really more on the kind of like the framing of the initial photograph, I would imagine. But why don't you tell us? Well, it starts actually even before the framing. It's um... I look at scenes all the time uh, as if I had a camera to my eye, even though I don't. And when I, I see something, um, often it'll be instinctive. I won't know right away why I'm attracted to it, but I'll know I'm attracted to it. I'll capture it. Um, when I can, I try to capture it um, from a number of different perspectives, but sometimes this was a grab shot in uh, Trinidad, Cuba, and we were on the move, and I may have taken one other image in this square, but uh, I'll try to, uh, what photographers call work the subject, um, and uh, zoom with my feet, uh, move around, and just look at different angles, and how does this look, and that's just the beginning, because then when I come back and get it on the computer, uh, I may further alter it, um, I may emphasize the colors a little more, or I may play them down. Uh, this one is you know, slightly more saturated than the real thing, but uh, pretty close to it. And it's that the combination of colors, I think, that attracts me um, in this case, but it was also the shapes, the, uh, those phone booth hoods, just you know, between the color and the shape were terrific. Um, and to see these two guys, you know, just, um, both of whom I think are bike taxi drivers, um, and there are plenty of cell phones, so I'm not clear why they are using a cell phone rather, uh, the uh, payphone rather than the cell phone, but um, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll look at things. And then interestingly, I'll also go back to them sometimes years later and see them differently. Uh, I may crop them differently uh, and it becomes a new image. Uh, but uh, the, the process is uh, partly very deliberate and geometric and partly just very intuitive. So interesting. Um, do you have anything in general that you say like, like about what actually makes a good photograph? I mean, you talked about intuition but I'm gonna just kind of scroll through a few images here and feel free to stop me if you if there's anything that feels like a talking point. Um, well, but, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say like, I mean. Well, the, the, <clears throat> many of these shots are happenstance. This particular one um, was uh, walking in the Tuileries with my wife and daughter and out of my peripheral vision, I noticed the orange turban. And I just swung around and I had a small camera. I zoomed out as far as I could, but it wasn't really far enough. So what you're seeing is actually pretty cropped from the original, but it was the orange turban that caught my eye. Uh, and we just kept moving. Um, and I sort of have a sense when I take things like that, that that's probably a good picture. Uh, I don't realize till later when I really look at it and much more carefully and critically, uh, sometimes I'll, like on this one, I'll go, wow, that's better than I thought it was going to be. Um, it's nice when that happens. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Um, and a lot of these are grab shots. This was in Hanoi. Um, we were in a market area with a guide and I looked up and I said, oh my God. Uh, and it just, I think the first thing besides the chaos in it, uh, and, and uh, this was actually before I started the Order and Chaos series, which was a couple of months later. Uh, but I, I sensed the chaos. And professionally, I also saw the back of what computer cabinets used to look like many decades ago and were referred to as a rat's nest of wiring. And this was one of those. And then my second thought was, how in the hell did they maintain that? And we still don't know. But um, so, you know, I'm kind of scanning all around me, uh, sometimes vis visibly by my head turning and sometimes my eyes are just moving a lot. And I see things like this and I almost always have a camera with me. So when I see them, I capture them. I love it. Now, Rosa, you're also known or pop one thing that's popular with you is your telephone wires. Um, oh, do we have a dog that has joined us? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh no, that's fine. I thought I was gonna have to bring my new puppy with us this evening, but I was spare. Give me my lap sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just gonna pull up, this is the piece that's underneath Order and Chaos on the wall that I showed earlier. And um, I love the telephone wires in here. I love the, when I realized that it's a snowy piece as well. I, I, I really appreciated the details that I saw in it. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what it's like paper cutting telephone wires? Uh, it goes very slowly. <laughs> it is definitely one of those, you know, uh, looking at Howard's photograph of Hanoi, it reminds me a lot of the pictures that I took when I was in China and Xi'an and it's the same tangle and like, I'm convinced that they don't maintain them. They just run a new line every time something breaks and that's why there are so many of them. I don't know if that's that right. Um, but with something like that, you know, they're so jumbled that if a line doesn't work out and I accidentally cut through it, I can usually just omit it and you'd never know the difference. But with something like this, where there are so few of them, you really need them to be in place. Um, you know, for example, in this part where there's sort of three in a row going almost vertically, if that center one had torn, I think it would really look off. Um, so you kind of go slow and hope for the best. <laughs> And what, um, are there certain pictures that you look at and you say, this will make a, big, a good paper cut? Like what, are there things that you see? Oh, and we also have a question of where this particular picture is. So start wherever you want. I think you can use the power lines a lot, especially in a piece like this to kind of guide your eye. So the fact that they're going right, you know, down the side of the street here, I think just pulls you in and it kind of helps you go with the flow of traffic quite literally in this piece. Um, 
sometimes I like that they're kind of a web and they end up more swoopy and it just brings your eyes up. And I think it, there's something for me like sort of weirdly spiritual about uh, power lines and uplifting scenes within cityscapes. I've had people send me strange emails like, why do you only cut depressing images? And I don't think that I often do. <laughs> Um, so to me, like, I think there's a lot of beauty in stopping to appreciate the sky in a city, which you don't often, I think usually if you think of, uh, landscapes that involve sky, you're also picturing a lake or rolling hills or something like that. Um, so I think the power lines for me are mostly just a reminder to look up. This is a uh, prohibition tap room in Philadelphia. This is 13th and just two blocks South of Spring Garden Street. I actually lived across the street from this bar for about four years and I, hate the snow. <laughs> so if it was snowing out, I used to be a school teacher. If it was snowing out and I got a snow day, I would walk the 10 steps across the street and just hide out there for the day. <laughs> so, so this must be a kind of a real nostalgic piece for you then. For sure. <laughs> now we have a question of, do you start with a specific drawing? Um, but I would say, I believe you start with an actual physical photograph. Is that correct? Yeah. So I start from my uh, photographs and I print them out and I'm literally cutting through the photograph and in this case the gray paper, there's a silver underneath, I don't know how much that comes across in the photos. So I'm cutting through a printed black and white photograph just on regular computer paper and this gray art paper that I've used and then I throw away that stencil at the end. Now if you had someone who like, let's say I had like a really cool photograph um, that I wanted to get paper cut, do you do, you do commissions like yes. I can do? any photograph I want and say, can you paper cut this for me? You can do that, yeah. Um, I definitely, you know, if it's a commission and you're sending me a photograph that you're interested in having cut, we'll have to have a conversation about it because sometimes there are things that I will have to change from the original in order to keep everything connected because mm -hmm. I don't use adhesives most of the time. So we don't want your letters floating off into space. <laughs> no, probably not, but, but so yeah, so you start with your specific photograph in all cases. Now, are most of your pictures from the Northeast? I guess not, if you had that one in Yokohama. I'm just gonna go through and- um... Oh yeah, I've got Japan, China, uh, South Africa, Israel in general. These pieces, I believe, are all Japan, China, and East Coast. Where's this one? This is China, this is Xi'an. Okay. This is in the Muslim Quarter, which is a really interesting neighborhood. Sure, that's fascinating. As someone who lived in Hong Kong for many years, I feel like this, this really reminded me of Hong Kong. So I love this one. Um, this is Baltimore. Oh, this is Baltimore. Yeah. And this is also Baltimore. I love that peeling paint and the lettering there. <laughs> Fantastic. Every time I move something, I like that. This is a piece I love. I mean, the amount of bricks that you had to cut out is insane on this piece. <laughs> I like the bricks. I, I, I just don't know how to keep everything straight. I mean, it just, the, the level of precision amazes me. Um, do we have, I'm gonna, we'll get into the real Q&A in a second. So start, start thinking about some questions that you may have, but I have, um, one question for each of you now, Rosa and Howard, which is um, what is one piece of advice you would give to an aspiring artist or photographer? When you're thinking about people who are, want to get into either your craft or the art world in general, what, what's something that you would tell them? And it can be more than one thing, but what's some advice you would give? I'll let either one of you start. Well, from a photography standpoint, um, I think the first thing is just shoot a lot and just keep shooting, but don't shoot for the hell of it, just shoot and critique and, and get feedback um, and continue to evolve and experiment. Um, one of the, you asked about influences before, one of the more recent uh, online mentors that I've been using uh, for the last few years, it's a fellow in Canada named David Duchemin, and he is amazing, uh, very creative. Um, and his big thing is um, sketch images. So if, when I was talking about working the subject, effectively, you create a lot of um, sketches in your mind and in the camera uh, and use those to get to the real one. Um, 
And you don't even know sometimes when you've gotten to the real one, you've just got to keep working at it. Uh, but this is not something you do casually. You, you've got to just keep working at it and plug away. Okay. Now I have to follow that. Uh, so everything Howard said, but then also, you know, I had somebody who recently asked me, um, she's a relatively new paper cutter. And she said, I want to get into the paper cut world. What do I do? And I said, well, okay, well, what do you mean? You know, are you looking to become a better paper cutter for yourself because you enjoy it and it's your meditation? Are you looking to be showing in art galleries or are you looking to do fairs and make some extra cash? So I think really figuring out what you want to be getting out of your art is a big step one. Um, you know, if you're doing it because it's what you love, then I think you'll be able to guide yourself for the most part. It's just a matter of finding community, finding as many other people as you can who are working in your medium. Uh, you know, especially once we get to more normal times and you can go to events and be hanging out in people's studios and doing things like that. Uh, I think the more that you start to see as possible within the medium, the more you want to figure out and it just helps you figure out, you know, your own ideas and how you're going to make it your own. I love that. Thank you, Rosa. An another uh, aspect that I think probably applies to pretty much any medium is study the masters and understand, figure out what is it that makes that a great picture. And um, don't copy it, but just try to internalize it and think about how would I do something like that? I agree. That's the kind of advice for going to museums and just exposing yourself, looking at art books, doing whatever you can to see other people's work. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I don't know if you guys are seeing the chat, but we just had a question come in. You both spent years or decades practicing and honing your craft. What keeps you so deeply engaged in your work? I, I guess I know I use the word meditation a lot in talking about my art, but I do really find that to be true for me. And I become a very cranky, mean person if I go too long without paper cutting. Uh, so it feels like something that I have to be doing, at least in some capacity. And in terms of, you know, how I stay engaged with it and how I've continued to, I guess, keep my interest in it, it's really just changing what I do. If I'm feeling creatively stuck, then I work on a tiny little five by seven or something just to feel like I completed it and it's good and it's done. And there I did something with my day. Um, right now I'm working on a series of life-size self-portraits. So I'm really, you know, just trying to push myself and discover new things within paper all the time. And what about you, Howard? Um, I think the best way to describe it is a few books that have this title. It's called The Joy of Photography. Uh, I just really enjoy, um, when I was an amateur and now as a professional, I, uh, just seeing things, capturing them, and kind of making them my own. Um, there's literally an infinite amount of scenes out there to uh, get your attention and you have to do something with it. And I just enjoy the whole process from uh, pre-visualizing to capturing uh, and then the technical aspects of post-processing. Um, but the ultimate for me is those relatively few pieces that actually get printed because the printed photograph for me is just so much uh, that there's so much more to it than uh, just seeing it on the screen. Uh, part of it's uh, the, the texture, the tonality is a li little different. It actually has some heft to it, depending what kind of paper you use. Um, but I, I enjoy that entire end to end process and I'm, I keep discovering uh, new things, and that's part of the fun of it. There's just, there's always a new aspect. Fantastic. Um, is there anyone else who has a question they would like to ask? They can put it in the chat, or you can feel free at this point to unmute yourselves. I'll give you guys a second to do that. Um, and if not, no problem. We can also Wrap off a little hey, bit. Howard. I heard a hi, Howard, but I know where it came from. <laughs> so you don't recognize the voice anymore. Hold on. I'm going to take you guys off. I'm going to unpin you guys and then, or un, unspotlight you. 
and then hopefully it'll what it will do is it means that the speaker will was that you tracy yep <laughs> Yes, now I put the voice and the face together. Great to see you. Thank you for joining. Uh, for those local folks, Tracy's in California. Little time zone shift here. So what I'm curious about, Howard, um, I mean, I've kind of, you know, ever since you got into this and started letting the rest of us know, um, I, you know, I, I look at your stuff. You know, every time you send me an email, I pick a couple of things to look at. And I'm curious about how you sort of have come to, I'll use the word, specialize in um, architectural kinds of things. And you may remember that my father was an architect, so I'm attracted to, to those pieces. I did not remember that. Um, Tracy and I worked together at Digital Equipment in the 80s, so it goes back a ways. Um, I actually evolved into the architecture. I, I've always had an interest in it uh, when I was in high school for a very short period, I thought I might become an architect. Um, but I really started, you'll notice in all the things that I do, the last piece of the word is scape. I started with landscapes uh, and then waterscapes. Um, and, um, but I'm, I'm just visually attracted to the geometry, the patterns, the reflections, uh, the angles. Uh, of the architecture, and you could just do so much with them with photography. True. It's nice to see you. <laughs> Great to see you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you for joining all the way from California. Well, it's earlier here, you know, it's, you know, you just sort of have to, as long as you remember it's three hours and you can't lose track of time. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? I noticed we had one um, late joiner, so I will remind you that this is being recorded and all you need to do in order to get a copy of the recording is to email me or to contact me or if you just go on the website and contact Beacon Gallery, um, contact at beacongallery.com. That also goes to me and I can send you a copy. So don't worry if you've missed anything here. Um, while we're waiting to see if there are any final questions, what I'm gonna do is just share a, um, let's see, where did that go? I want to share a screen with you, but I'm not somehow seeing how to do that. All of a sudden it's like disappeared um, from here. Share screen, there we go. Um, just some coming events at the gallery. I want to remind everyone that we have our second first Friday with Urban Landscapes coming up. That's going to be from 5 to 8 p.m. I will probably be here earlier, um, but if you want to come in earlier than that, do let me know. Send me a little message, um, an email, message on Instagram, give me a call, and I'll make sure that I'm here for you. So that's coming up on the 5th of February. Um, we then have our next artist talk with Sam Belisle and Michael McLaughlin, the other two artists in Urban Landscapes, coming up on the 10th of February at 6 p.m. That's a Wednesday as well. Um, your last day to see Urban Landscapes is going to be Valentine's Day. So if you're looking for something to do with your sweetheart, come out to the art galleries around here. There are lots. You don't just have to come and see the show. Um, we will then on the following Friday have a new show opening called Guillermo Galindo's Sonic Biogenesis, Genomics and Mutant Jungles. So we're going to be going in kind of a completely different direction. We're going from kind of the, the macro looking at landscapes to the micro where he has blown up little teeny tiny things like uh, insects and, and microbes and they make for really amazing images and we're talking about um, all different concepts around genetic mutations and things of that nature and we'll definitely have an, an artist talk with him as well that is not yet scheduled he's out in california so tracy you'll be on the same same time uh time frame as him uh so it'll probably work for you hopefully and then oh, good. I'm emailing this, so you'll send me the link, right? Yes, you should be on our um, you should be on our mailing list now, so you get the link for that. And then our first Friday for that show, one of multiple, will be on the fifth of March. 
So just wanted to make sure that all of you guys would see that. You'll get some emails about those things. If you feel like you get too many emails from us, feel free to unsubscribe, but hopefully you won't feel that way. Um, here, I'm gonna just stop the share. So you can go back over here. Um, <laughs> so if there are no more questions, I think we'll probably leave it there. Are there any last questions or comments? I think it, we're, I'm getting some thank you. So I'm gonna guess probably not. So let me thank all of you for attending this evening. Let me thank Rosa and Howard as well for coming and sharing your work with all of us. And, and thank you so much because I love having it in the gallery. This is a really great show and it's been fantastic to have it here. Um, I hope you'll- Making it possible. Yeah, glad to be a part of it. And, um, yeah, so thank you to everyone and have a good evening.